great monkey face. The rise of Hideyoshi. The attack upon Korea. The conflict with Christianity. Queen Elizabeth and Akbar, as the Japanese would instructively put it, were contemporaries of the great Hideyoshi. He was a peasant's son, known to his friends, and later to his subjects, as Sariman Kanja, Monkey Face, for not even Confucius could rival him in ugliness. Unable to discipline him, his parents sent him to a monastic school, but Hideyoshi made such fun of the Buddhist priests and raised such turmoil and insurrections that he was expelled. He was apprenticed to various trades and was discharged 37 times. He became a bandit, decided that more could be stolen by law than against it, joined the service of a samurai, i.e. a sword-bearing man, saved his master's life, and was thereafter allowed to carry a sword. He joined Nobunaga, helped him with brains as well as courage, and when Nobunaga died, 1582, took the lead of the lawless rebels who had set out to conquer their native land. Within three years, Hideyoshi had made himself ruler of half the empire, had won the admiration of the impotent emperor, and felt strong enough to digest Korea and China. With Korean troops, he modestly announced to the Son of Heaven, aided by your illustrious influence, I intend to bring the whole of China under my sway. When that is effected, the three countries will be one. I shall do it as easily as a man rolls up a piece of matting and carries it away under his arm." He tried hard, but a villainous Korean invented a metal warboat, a pre-plagiarism of the Monitor and the Merrimack, and destroyed one after another of the troop-laden ships that Hideyoshi had dispatched to Korea. Seventy-two vessels were sunk in one day and the very sea ran blood. Forty-eight other vessels were beached and deserted by the Japanese, and burned to the water by the victors. After an indecisive alternation of successes and defeats, the attempt to conquer Korea and China was postponed until the 20th century. Hideyoshi, said the Korean king, had tried to measure the ocean in a cockle shell. Meanwhile, Hideyoshi had settled down to enjoy and administer the regency that he had established. He provided himself with 300 concubines, but he bestowed a substantial sum upon the peasant wife whom he had long ago divorced. He looked up one of his old employers and returned to him with interest the money that he had stolen from him in apprentice days. He did not dare ask the emperor's consent to his assumption of the title of shogun, but his contemporaries gave him, in compensation, the name of Taiko, or Great Sovereign, which, by one of those strange verbal odysseys that characterize philology, is now entering our language as tycoon. Cunning and crafty beyond belief, as a missionary described him, he subtly disarmed the people by ordering all metal weapons to be contributed as material for a colossal statue, the Daibutsu, or Great Buddha, of Kyoto. He appears to have had no religious beliefs, but he was not above making use of religion for the purposes of ambition or statesmanship. Christianity had come to Japan in 1549 in the purpose and person of one of the first and noblest of Jesuits. St. Francis Xavier. The little community which he established grew so rapidly that within a generation after his coming there were 70 Jesuits and 150,000 converts in the empire. They were so numerous in Nagasaki that they made that trading port a Christian city and persuaded its local ruler, Omura, to use direct action in spreading the new faith. Within Nagasaki territory, says Lafcadio Hearn, Buddhism was totally suppressed, its priests being persecuted and driven away. Alarmed at this spiritual invasion, 
In suspecting it of political designs, Hideyoshi sent a messenger to the vice-provincial of the Jesuits in Japan, armed with five peremptory questions. Why, and by what authority, he and his religieux constrained Hideyoshi's subjects to become Christians? Why they induced their disciples and their sectaries to overthrow temples? Why they persecuted the Buddhist priests? Why they and the other Portuguese ate animals useful to man, such as oxen and cows? Why he allowed the merchants of his nation to buy Japanese and make slaves of them in the Indies? Not satisfied with the replies, Hideyoshi issued, in 1587, the following edict. Having learned from our faithful counselors that foreign religieux have come into our realm, where they preach a law contrary to that of Japan, and that they have even had the audacity to destroy temples dedicated to our native gods Kami and Otoke, although this outrage merits the severest punishment, wishing nevertheless to show them mercy, we order them under pain of death to quit Japan within 20 days. During that space, no harm or hurt will come to them, but at the expiration of that term, we order that if any of them be found in our states, they shall be seized and punished as the greatest criminals. Amid all these alarms, the great buccaneer found time to encourage artists to take part in no plays, and to support Rikyu in making the tea ceremony a stimulant to Japanese pottery and an essential ornament of Japanese life. He died in 1598, having exacted from Iyasu a promise to build a new capital at Yedo, now Tokyo, and to recognize Hideyoshi's son Hideyori as heir to the Regency in Japan. <laughs>